All right, folks, here's another one. This one is for Samuel Calvin. Here's another one for you. Latin America City, unequal, dangerous, and fragile, but that can change. Latin America is one of the planet's most urbanized regions. Three of its mega cities are among the world's largest, Buenos Aires, Mexico, and Sao Paulo. Sprawling metropolises like Bogota, Lima, and Rio de Janeiro are not far behind. These cities are complex, competitive, and dynamic. Many Latin American cities also suffer from what scholars refer to as peripheralization. They are fragmented, segregated, and exclusionary. In a word, they are fragile. The bulk of Latin America's urbanization is taking place behind the scenes. In addition to the massive cities and perturbations up and down Latin America's Atlantic and Pacific coastlines, there are another 310 cities with populations over 16,000 smaller towns. Today, 82% of the population lives in cities. Already some 93% of Venezuelans, 92% of Argentinians, Uruguayans, 90% and of Brazilians, and 89.3% of Chileans live in cities. The move to the city occurred at breathtaking speed. In 1950, there were 69 million people living in cities. By 2025, there are expected to be 575 million there. The center of economic gravity has also shifted to cities with at least two-thirds of the region's GDP based on services and industry in urban areas, but the dividends of urbanization have not been shared equally. The darker side to urbanization. Although the elite have done well out of Latin America's urban revolution, the poor still struggle to access basic services, including security, public transport, water, and sanitation. Latin America's cities are the most unequal on the planet. Roughly 11 of the region's 588 million inhabitants live in slums. Although poverty reduction was prioritized by many governments, Latin America is home to 10 of the 15 most unequal countries in the world. What's more, in 2015, the region was home to 47 of the 50 most murderous cities on earth. Get that, Samuel Calvin. Cities in El Salvador, Honduras, Mexico, and Guatemala were at the top of the charts. Meanwhile, Brazil fields a whopping 32 cities on the list. Most of them clustered along the northern and eastern coast. There are strong indications that lethal violence will continue escalating in Latin America's cities in contrast to virtually everywhere else. Not surprisingly, urban dwellers single out insecurity as their overriding priority. Many Latin American cities suffer from a range of risks contributing to fragility. It is not necessarily the large cities, but the fast growing ones that are most susceptible. As a new data visualization on fragile cities shows, Buenos Aires, Mexico, and Sao Paulo have violent crime rates that are below the national average. However, those cities growing at over 4% a year, such as San Pedro Sula, Honduras, La Guanilas, Venezuela, Villa Vincenzo, Colombia, Santa Cruz, Bolivia, Ciudad de Este, Paraguay tend to experience disproportionately higher rates of homicide. Other risks of urban fragility include weak security and justice institutions. Youth, unempl youth unemployment, check that out. Remember that one, Samuel Calvin. Youth unemployment and especially social and income inequality. Remember that one too, Samuel Calvin. For example, cities like San Juan, Santo Domingo, Salvador, and Port-au-Prince Port register unemployment rates stretching from 14% to 49%. The more unequal is setting the higher rates of violence. Although inequality has declined across the region, progress has stalled. The World Bank in Sidlac recently detected reversals in inequality in some parts of Central America's Northern Triangle and the Andean region, precisely in cities where crime and violence is on the upswing. Critical and reversing fragility is targeted investment aimed at bringing down violence. Innovative solutions to the challenge. The news is not all bad. There are some promising examples from across Latin America of governments, especially munis municipal authorities, incubating new approaches to designing out crime. 
Many of them are adopting data-driven approaches to improving public safety. Their successes are neither incidental nor accidental. They are not getting results by reinforcing police, increasing penalties, or building more prisons, but by experimenting with preventative approaches, replicating innovations and scaling success. There are several priorities for Latin American cities, especially the smaller and medium-sized one. First, public safety and security policies and programs must be data-driven. Remarkably, less than 6% of the public security and justice measures undertaken across Latin America and Caribbean have evidentiary base. Even so, there are certain targeted measures, focused deterrence, cognitive theory, childhood interventions that can generate positive crime prevention dividends. There are other popular activities, community policing, gun buybacks, abstinence only programs that are less effective in bringing violence down. The mobilization of solid evidence to drive interventions is, nece is a necessary condition of success. Second, focus energy and resources on very specific places, people, and behavior. This is because criminal violence is often sticky. About 50% of homicidal violence in cities take place in less than 2% of street addresses. See that? Often just a small number of people are most at risk of perpetrating or being a victim of crime in a particular neighborhoods. Only about 0.5% of the population are responsible for 75% of murders. If crime prevention in the city is the goal, open-ended community-based activities are the wrong way to go. But rather coordinated activities emphasizing hotspot and problem-oriented policing must be highly targeted, diligently implemented, and ad adequately resourced. Third, we must explore careful experiments in decriminalizing and regulating drugs. Where have we heard that before? A drug-free world is a fiction. Regulation is not the same as legalization. There are a tremendous range of options residing between outright prohibition and legalization. City mayors are experimenting with decriminalization of use, harm reduction and prescription-based approaches. Strict market regulation, loose regulation, and even commercial promotion. There are different ways to practically make drugs available in a controlled manner, including medical prescriptions, sales in pharmacies, licensed sales, and licensed premises, personal cultivation and users, cooperatives, and even unlicensed providers. Fourth, take action to strengthen social cohesion. Bam! and improve underlying and social economic condition in specific marginal areas. While difficult, the fostering of a strong bonds and a sense of mutual responsibility is a critical step in improving safety and security. This means real investments in improving tangible public goods and restoring the resilience of the state. Good examples of this include predictable public transit, improvements in housing and neighborhood conditions rather than relocating populations and even conditional cash transfers and to in support to single parents these four pathways are not theoretical constructs they have been tested and applied in cities like bogota ciudad juarez medellin mexico df santiago chile Sao Paulo, and more. The key is that city governments, private sector actors, and civil society groups make a plan and stick to it. A new study by the Igrape Institute and the Inter-American Development Bank, in cooperation with the World Economic Forum, reviews 10 cases where highly targeted reforms generated important returns in public safety. The good news is that enlightened mayors across Latin America are taking steps to building in resilience and reduce fragility risks. Those that do will unlock the full potential of the urban revolution. Those that do not will fall behind. And that is from the World Economic Forum in Latin America. In other words, saying that they do not know what causes crime and violent crime, like I said before, is what? Bullshit. I'm going to say it again, Samuel Calvin. Bullshit. They already know. 
It's already been implemented. Now, whether you want to spend the money or not is a different story because the study that you showed me that I read said exactly that. They were trying to figure out how how little money they can get away with to bring about a positive effect. They already know what causes crime and and they figured out what parts of poverty does call crime. And just like I said, just like the picture I showed you in Chicago. The data already shows you where the hot spots are. The vast majority of people in a given city do not commit violent crimes. Everybody knows where the trouble spots are. You can walk to talk, go to any police precinct on the planet. They can tell you where the bad zones are, where the bad actors are, where the bad blocks are by street. It doesn't take quantification to figure out who and what and where the bad areas are. It's not that many people. If you have a neighborhood watch, they will actually call in and give you all the data you need, who, when, what, where, and how. But you got to put resources behind it in that area, in those schools. Why would Chicago take schools and resources out of the most poverty-stricken areas and then expect nothing to happen? They took the schools out of Chicago, out of those areas. And they bust the kids across town, took all the resources out of that area. Why? You allow illegal drug activity in, in, coming through Chicago. Violence spiked up. Everything that I pointed out in my video is right here and has been proven. You can't get any better than the World Economic Forum. I don't care who you point out, what college that you, that you point to, whoever did the fucking studies, you can't get better than the World Economic Forum. When the World Economic Forum does something, money comes behind it. The best minds in the world come behind it. They get data from all over the world. Every hot spot, every violent place, every urban city, they get data from not just ones here. And we're talking about extreme poverty and extreme violence. And then one of some of the city's worst places, the world's worst places, worst cities, worst, worst urban areas, they already know how to do it, just like they showed in, you know, in the graph. How do you reduce urban crime? How do you reduce urban poverty? They already know how to do it. So the saying that poverty does not cause crime, bullshit, they just said it. How can you overcome the effects of poverty? Just like anything else. They know that certain conditions can cause you to have the flu, cause you cause disease. How do you overcome your circumstances with targeted, targeted strategies? It's a human problem and can be overcome with human interventions, targeted interventions. There are barriers to everything. You wouldn't have almost 8 billion people on the planet if you haven't overcome the limitations of growing and getting food to people. There was a limitation to it. You had to figure your way out of it. Saying that it doesn't cause it. Yes, it does cause it. But the thing is, what do you do to overcome the obvious downsides of urbanization? It's not rocket science, folks. You guys go into charts and quantifications and all this. You don't need all that. You don't need all that. You don't need all the quantifications and figuring out, you know, because you're trying to turn the dials. You don't need to go down and turn dials. There's only a few neighborhoods that cut up like that. You go down there, you talk to the people and you figure out what they need. First thing everybody says, if you want to get, get rid of crime, especially violent crime, is you put those kids to work. What did Roosevelt do when he was faced with what? Revolution. I mean, armed sur insurrection. That's what he was faced with. What did he do to the young men? And, and boys, he put them to work, found uh, jobs for them to do. He made the rich people pay for it. There's an old saying, idle hands are the workshop of the devil. Unemployed kids, unemployed boys between the 15 and 45 or 15 and 35 will commit crimes. That has been proven. Unemployed men or males between 15 and 35 will cause armed insurrection if you have enough of them. That's been proven. Quigley talked about that. 
They already know that. That's how come they look at demographics. You got to give them something to do, which is the same thing. Every kid on every country on the face of the earth says exactly the same thing. Why did you do this? Why did you get involved with this? Because I had nothing to do and I didn't have a job. Your government's responsibility is to coordinate these people. That's society's job. That's what you're supposed to do. Otherwise, you don't need a country. You don't need a society. If it's every person for themselves, you don't need a country. You don't need a president or Congress or anything like that. Uh, the government's job is to coordinate human capital. That is your job. Rather than giving them cash transfers, figure out how to coordinate these people and put them to work or give them something to do. If a mother's at home, have her teach her own kid. She's got nothing to do. If she's home at home looking at soap operas, you know, eating her food or whatever she's doing and screwing some nigga, at least give her uh, give her something uh, Internet based where she has to teach her own kid. And that kid has to perform at a certain level. So at the very least, you get an educated kid and possibly an educated mother, which is something I said about 10 years ago that goes on deaf ears because people feel sorry for women. I didn't just come to this yesterday in saying that that they don't know what causes crime like Jordan Peterson. You, you're a goddamn lie. It's a it's a four thousand year old problem. You're damn lie. They do know what causes it because cities have been around for like four thousand years. Poor people have been around for four thousand years. It didn't just start. Feel me? So say that it's, it's just black people or it's just uh, people that uh that have been socialized to suck and first suck and fuck the worst of, of men is bullshit because it happens all over the goddamn world in every country and every country has to manage this. Now, either you do it uh, like China that do does it, which is a very strict repression, like a very strict police state that keeps people in line. It ain't it ain't that Chinese are so are so much more what uh, smarter or anything like that. China has a very, very authoritarian, repressive government. They are very, very strict on even the smallest things. China is in a very, very authoritarian and very, very restrictive country. And it always has been. They don't play. You steal something, they cane you. Just like Singapore. How come Singapore is so safe? So, uh, so safe? You, you spray graffiti, they, they put a cane to your back. You sell drugs, they execute you. China does not play. But you don't, in the United States, you live in a liberal country. So you have to find a different way of doing things. If you want to live in an authoritarian, repressive government that peeks over your shoulder, you'll be safe. That won't happen. Look at Japan. How come Japan is so safe, so free of crime? Because it's a very authoritarian culture. If you steal a bike, they will hunt you down and find you and punish you. That doesn't exist in the United States. It's very, very, very liberal. They know what causes crime. They know what stops crime. What you hear from your academics is they parrot the same line because they want to keep their funding. There's certain things they can't talk about. The World Economic Forum is not interested in parroting or placating. They're interested in results because they got too many models that, uh, uh, that they have to replicate because urbanism is going to be a problem and they want to solve it. But anyway, that's all I got for this one. I'm going to jump off of this one. I just wanted to drop that in. Stop the bullshit. Stop trying to make excuses. Don't make excuses for your government. They know what they're doing. They know what they're capable of. And besides, if you look at the numbers of, of the, the worst uh, cities in, in the world compared to Chicago, really, the top, the, the, the top murder rate is 107 in 100,000. Chicago is what? Less than, what is it, less than 10? You don't really have a murder rate problem, okay? Comparatively to every place else, you don't have a murder rate problem. Could it be like two where where Lima, Peru is and places like that? Yeah, it could be. But there's certain steps that you have to do to get it down that way.
and the models already exist. It's not like they don't. We don't want to spend the money to follow them. That's all that is. It is what it is. Anyway, I'm going to jump off of here. This BGS out, and I'll see you guys on the next one.